All right, praise the Lord. I didn't have a title when Linda called me on Friday because I <clears throat> finished this yesterday. So the title is The Problem of Self. And this is not going to be a normal message. Okay, I normally preach, try to preach expository. So this is a little bit, a little bit different for me. So, and I, I remember whenever I kind of got the gist of the message that I felt like even if it was just for one person and changed one life, it would be worth it. So <clears throat> all of you perfect people put up with us imperfect people that might need to hear this message. Praise the Lord. Well, early this past Monday, I sort of suddenly woke up, and I had a dream that was just lingering in my spirit. And it was more of a feeling than details. Do you know what I'm saying? You just have this incredible feeling. And the essence of the dream was about how much somebody loved a dog. And that, I know it's kind of strange, but it was powerful. It was a powerful, strong kind of love. In this sense, it was almost heart-wrenching in its intensity. It was like this person had this searing love for this dog. And, and as I lay there, it was about 4.25 in the morning, I was flooded with this thought. This was the very thing that was flooding my heart. I wish I loved God that much. That's what was in my spirit. I was like, I felt what they felt for a dog. And I was like, man, I wish, wish I loved God that much. And I don't know if there's anything prophetic about it or not. I know dog and God is the opposite of each other, you know. Dyslexic. And dyslexic or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that. But I do feel like God, I dream a lot of dreams, but very few of them I feel like it's got some weight and direction. And this was... This was one of them. And so as I lay there, because I was, that's a good thing to be going, I wish I loved God that much. So I was just laying there, and as I did, I began to be flooded with recent conversations and recent things I'd heard and, and said. So I just got up and began to write, and that's sort of the impetus of this message, what kind of came out of that sense of writing and just searching my heart, God, what are you trying to what are you trying to say? So something I remembered was a couple of weeks earlier at one of the funerals I've done, I've done three funerals recently, and at one of the funerals I remember saying that sin in its most basic form is simply just a rebellion against God. When you think of sin, instead of trying to describe it with all this detail, you just come to the point where you recognize, you know what? I know God would rather me do it that way, but I'm going to do it this way. It's just putting yourself above God. And last Sunday in Sunday school, in discussing repentance, we were discussing repentance, and Sonia had a quote from Sam Storms, and just one line out of that quote, he said, failure to repent is a form of idolatry. And refusal to repent is to elevate our own souls above God's glory. So when you refuse to repent, you're saying, I know better than God, or I'm better than God, or at the least you're saying, I am going to serve myself before I serve God. I'm going to please myself before I please God. And then another conversation, these conversations were just kind of flooding in. It's kind of an interesting dynamic. I remembered a conversation I had with my mom, and she was telling me how she loved the way that Paul referred to himself as a bondservant or slave in the introduction of some of his letters. Like in Romans, Philippians, and Titus, he'll say, I, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. This was his mindset. Paul, comparing himself to Jesus, I'm just a slave to Jesus so going back to this thought, I wish I loved God as much as that person loved their dog. It's like when I got up, the Holy Spirit began to kind of lead me down a trail. Have you ever had this with a series of questions? Got my pen out, and the Holy Spirit's just kind of now probing me. 
And, 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 it, and it's like this. What gets between myself or someone else from being able to have this kind of love for God themselves? What could hinder this deep, passionate love for God that we say we want? And so as I'm being led down this trail of thoughts, could it be love of a, of a certain sin? And that's obvious that if we're in sin and we're giving ourselves over to sin, that would hinder us properly loving God. And then another question was, could it, could it be love of something special in my life? Is there something special in your life? You're, you know, a kayak, a jet ski, or just something that you do that can kind of almost be elevated too much to where that kind of becomes the idol of your life, that becomes your passion, and it gets between you and you being able to love God with all of your heart, soul, and strength? Could it, could it be a person? Could somebody else take the place of God in my life? Or I give so much to another person that God kind of takes second place. And, you know, I'm going through all these things in my mind, and all those things can hinder my relationship with God. But I believe the Holy Spirit led me to consider maybe there might be something else. And I'm not trying to be all-inclusive here. I'm sure there, you could probably name other things. But what else could get between me and this very profound and strong love of God that most people really fail to experience? I think we scratch the surface in loving God. It's like, well, what else could get between me and loving God that way? And I believe the answer that the Holy Spirit gave me, dong, he said, it's love of yourself. And I was like, whoa, can we include everybody else in that, please? <laughs> So I want us all to consider. This thought about ourselves. You know, going back to those thoughts that were just flooding in there. You know, a person who chooses to sin is in rebellion to God. A person who refuses to repent is, is in idolatry. That's idolatry. I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to bow. To God. And, and we see that a person that says, I'm going to sin regardless of, you know, God thinks about it, or I'm not going to bow to God in this area of my life, we know that they think too much of themselves. They're elevating themselves above God. You're not having the opposite, which is what Paul was actually modeling for us, this idea that I am a servant of Jesus Christ, and whatever he says to do, that I must do. It doesn't matter what my flesh or what my particular desires are. He's king. He's Lord. I'm the slave. I'm the servant. So this is so subtle. You know, it may be that on the surface, it looks like we're passing the test. You know, it looks like, oh, there's no major sin in my life. I don't think I have idols. There's no person I, I can think of that's, you know, getting between me and God. Nothing that I know of. But in the inner recesses of our souls, so well hidden that we don't really see it. I would imagine, at least for myself, there still lurks this sense of a self-satisfying, self-preserving, self-glorifying kind of a spirit that's, that's a me-first kind of a spirit. It's, it's a selfish spirit. It's very limiting because it limits how much we can really love God and how much we can really love other people. And I'm saying go past the surface. I'm saying go to the places that the Holy Spirit goes. You know, Jacques Cousteau would go way down in those pressurized uh, submarines. Let's go way down in those places that we don't like to visit because sometimes we don't like what we find down there. But maybe today we need to let the Holy Spirit take us there. It's interesting that the one thing that many of us profess, that, you know, that we want a very strong love connection with God. How many of you say, yes, I want a powerful, strong love connection with God? It's interesting that the very thing standing between us and having that might be ourselves. And, you know, there is a right kind of loving yourself. If you could put up the... Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. You look at this. Teacher, what's the 
commandment in the law is the greatest. He said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the greatest and most important commandment. And then he said, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So, you know, you have to have a a healthy and proper self-love in order to properly love others. Do we see that? We actually have to love ourselves if we're going to fulfill the second commandment, right? Because if you hate yourself, I would hate to love somebody up to that level of hating. You know, it's just, it doesn't compute. You have to kind of like yourself. You kind of have to love yourself. There has to be something healthy about that. It's good to love your child, to love your spouse. It's good to love your neighbor out of a healthy soul. So a pure love for anybody, a person, yourself included, is a good thing. This is not a message about you need to be self-deprecating, you know, you need to be self-demeaning, you need to put yourself down. This is not that, okay? This is not that. This is not about thinking less about yourself or who you are or who God made you. This is not about that. But it is about thinking about yourself less, in light of who God is and who other people. Does that, I know that sounds a little the same, but it's not. Don't think less about yourself, but think about yourself less. Maybe, does that make sense? You know, there's some people that it doesn't matter where they are. They want the attention on them. If they're in a wedding, they want to run up there and be, <laughs> and be getting married again. I mean, it's so crazy. If they're at a funeral, they want to be in the casket. I mean, they want to be the center of attention no matter where they are. <laughs> you know, it's just like... <laughs> you know, please look at me. And, and God says, I think we want a little less of that. As a matter of fact, you need to be thinking about yourself less and less and thinking about me more and more. And when you're in a crowd, stop thinking about yourself so much and start actually listening and thinking and seeing and feeling what other people are going through. You know, if we're really struggling to love God the way we should, if we're struggling to love other people the way we should, I'm just suggesting today, it's a very simple sermon, it's possible you love yourself too much. If you're really struggling with loving people, it may be because they're a little step beneath you because you're really number one. And you've only got so much energy and you're going to spend most of it on moi, okay? And whatever little crumbs, everybody else can just kind of fight for the, fight for the crumbs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the Bible speaketh for itself. How about that? Instead of me trying to convince you of anything, I'm just going to, I just grab some scriptures. And I'm just going to read them. I just actually even put them in chronological order from how they fall in the Old Testament. I mean, the New Testament. So Mark 10.45 The Bible says, even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I want to remind you, we're supposed to be imitators of Christ. So he's talking about giving his life. Luke 9.23, then Jesus said to all of them, anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So we're, we're talking about giving your life, denying yourself, taking up your cross. John 12, 24 through 25. I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. He said, the one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So we're talking about giving our life, denying ourselves, losing our lives. We know this one. Galatians 2, and in my translation, it actually hits verse 19 and 20. The Bible says, For through the law I've died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're supposed to identify with Jesus Christ in this crucified life. Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 2. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. How? 
will walk in love as the Messiah also loved us. Well, how did the Messiah walk in love and love us? He gave himself for us. A sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Again, giving yourself for others. And then a, a few more verses. We know Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Worship me by living sacrificially. And then going to Romans 15, verses 1 through uh, 3, the Bible says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and to not please ourselves. I'm sorry, but that just... That's just, you have an obligation not to please yourself. Is that weird? I mean, that's what God says. It doesn't, that doesn't, that's not what I hear. But that's what the Bible says. It, it, just take this verse. Each of us must please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Even the Messiah did not please himself. On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And then in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing out of rivalry, conceit, and humility. Consider others as more important than yourself. Everybody should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Philippians 3, 3, you have died. Your life is hidden with the Messiah and God. And, And see... Jesus has his John 3.16. We have our John 3.16. It's 1 John 3.16. This is how we have come to know love. Jesus laid his life down for us, John 3.16. We should also lay our lives down for our brothers, 1 John 3.16. I mean, do you see a little bit of a a theme emerging here from, from, from Scripture? These are some of the core teachings of the Bible. You know, that we abandon ourselves to God, that we lay our lives down for the sake of others, and more precisely, that we die to ourselves to get the power to live for God and to live rightly before others. You know, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, any teaching that starts with us and our needs rather than the glory of God is unscriptural. It is all about the glory of God and not the glory of ourself. The foundation for all that we do must be to bring glory to God. We have to first and foremost seek to please God before we please ourselves. You know, there's a huge emphasis in our culture that, that just center on people's needs in such a way that makes people the center of the universe. If you go to Madison Avenue and you go to the whole marketing ploy of New York City and everywhere else, it's about finding out how to manipulate your flesh. And it's really easy. You know, they use lines like, you deserve this. Whether it's a car or whether it's a hot dog, you deserve it. Or you need this. You actually need a new iPhone. You need an Apple 11. Have they got to 12 yet? No. So you need, you need it. You must have it in order to be able to run across the screen and do twists and twirls and and be a pretty person. You must have this or you must have that. It's just a subliminal appeal to your selfish nature because I tell you how wonderful you are. You deserve this, Peggy. You need this, Peggy. Your life is unfulfilled if you don't have it. (laughs) Because you're such a saint. And I know that you've lived the opposite of this. I know you sacrificed your life in Romania. You know, this this whole marketing thing has gotten actually in the church culture the way we do business at church. How can, how can the church serve me? How can this particular church, as I shop around, how can it help me succeed? How, how, does it, how is it affecting me? What are the programs? What is this? What can this church do for me? You know, sometimes God doesn't want you to get jack squat out of church. He wants you to give 
to that church. He puts you in a church that can't do anything for you because he wants you to do something for them. Maybe wrap your mind around that a little bit. But we don't think that way a lot of times. And so what can you do for me? You know, whether it's books or conferences or teachings or church styles, the way a church actually styles itself, if this is what is foremost promoted, then what happens is it creates a self-centered, self-focused, selfish brand of Christianity. It's just a selfish brand of Christianity. We are marketing ourselves to meet your felt needs before we consider the glory of God. And listen, I don't want to suffer, and I don't want to be poor, and I don't want to be all that kind of stuff, but sometimes the way through to God being glorified, sometimes the way that God's will is accomplished, it's, it, it doesn't look like a beer commercial on TV. It doesn't look like the marketing ads in the newspaper and in, on, on, on YouTube and everything else, or Facebook, which I would almost call false book, where everybody's giving this way of looking like life that is just extraordinary, and we, we spin and pirouette, and everything's wonderful. But that's not the way that Christianity is worked out a lot of times in people's lives. A lot of times God says there's, there's valleys and mountains, there's lions and tigers and bears I want you to fight. There's all this stuff. And I believe that the deepest levels of joy come from when we're willing to walk out God's will, come what may, because we know that he walks with us and he'll get us through it. And if we don't get through it, then we just get the shortcut straight to heaven and we get to be with him forever. And so I'm talking about selfishness because true biblical Christianity is how can I serve God and how can I serve other people. We're to live to bring glory to God. We're to live to embrace the call to serve other people. And this requires dying to self and taking on a servant mentality. See, when we enter this delusion, and it is a delusion, I want to break your bubble. If you think you are precious and the greatest thing on the face of the earth, you're not, okay? (laughs) You're precious to all of us because we love each other. But who is most precious? Jesus. Jesus alone is most precious. So when we enter this delusion, this idolatrous self-love, we are entering into a danger zone. And what happens is we short-circuit God's purpose. We just read God's purpose. Love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. and Love your neighbor as yourself. I know that sounds limiting, but it's not. It's just... It's just a beginning. When you love your neighbor as yourself, you'll tell them about Jesus Christ. When you love your neighbor as yourself, you'll you'll give to help them. When you love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, everything and all your priorities of life get put in place. You know, when we love ourselves more than God and we love ourselves more than other people, this idolatry, it can give us an almost evil justification for all kinds of attitudes and behaviors. See, we can justify fleshly sins like sex or gluttony or whatever because I deserve this. I deserve this. We can justify these sins even in marriage. We can trample the rights in the heart of the other person because I deserve it. And you need to serve me. We can justify divorce because I deserve to be happy. You know, this wrong kind of attitude can make us into cruel dictators. And I know a lot of you are thinking, man, I've got to get this CD because I've got somebody to give it to. But while you're thinking that thought, okay, while you're thinking that thought, bear with me. This could be us. Please, bear with me. It's possible maybe on some levels that we don't quite see that I'm trying to help you see because I am living this out. I'm walking this out. I'm trying to apply this to my own life. 
But again, shifting back, this wrong kind of attitude, me first, can turn you into a cruel dictator. How dare you offend me? How dare you? How dare you offend me? You're my wife. How dare you say that you're my child? You're my friend. Or you're somebody I don't even know. How dare you offend me? How dare you disagree with me? What, what, what put it into you that you have the right to disagree with me? I'll tell you what, when you get offended, when somebody disagrees with you, you need to kind of check your heart and check your spirit. Here's another one. And these are things that just came into my spirit as I'm writing, okay? I know that I am right. Therefore, my nasty attitude towards you is justified. I know that I'm right. That empowers me to have a nasty attitude because I am right. You're wrong. I'm right. I'm empowered to be mean to you and to be nasty to you. I've already offended someone. <laughs> you know, a group of people can take on this same persona. It's not just individuals. A church can take on this persona. Political factions can take on this persona. People, a group of people can take on this persona. You know, a bunch of people who think a certain way, a bunch of people who form the same way, I mean, who think the same way, they can form a coalition together, and it becomes, we are right, therefore everybody else is wrong. We are right, therefore everybody else is wrong, and it's sort of a self-feeding thing because we surround ourselves with people who think the same way and believe the same way and tell each other that we're right, so that all of a sudden we become callous to the fact that other people and other groups of people might think differently. We can't see that because we've surrounded ourselves with like-minded people that think the same way. Therefore, we are right and everybody else is wrong. So marriages, relationships, society in general devolves down to a bunch of I am right. Battery is dead. All right, are we going to this now? All right. All right. What I was saying is it just devolves down to a point where we got a bunch of I am right people fighting against each other. And you look at society in general right now. You look at church culture. You look at all the arguments. I am right. I am right. I am right. It's impossible that I could be wrong. And everybody feels justified by their attitudes. But many times, it's just a pharisaical spirit. It's just a pharisaical spirit. Because you know, you, you can be right, but you can be wrong. Have you ever thought about that? See, the Sermon on the Mount, the Christian manifesto that Jesus gives us for how to live life, you know what that teaches us? If I just want to reduce down, you know, the whole Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' greatest message, he's telling you, he's telling me, lay down your right to be right for the greater good. Jesus is saying, lay down your right to be right. Now, I'm not talking about moral infidelity or anything like that. I'm not talking about that. I think you know what I'm talking about. You can be right in a legalistic way. You can cross the T and dot the I, and you can be right, but you can be dead wrong 
in the way that you apply your rightness over somebody else. What's the point in all of this happy little diatribe that I am releasing today? I pray it is a sermon from God's heart. What is the point in all of this? The point is, this could be us. I, I, I don't like it anymore whenever we say, you know, we're okay. Or we presume we're okay. But, boy, we could sure preach this sermon down the street, you know, in that church. We could sure preach this sermon to a, a, a group of people over there. Now, I really felt strongly about this because the first person God said this could be was me. And I'm just sharing the blessing with the rest of the congregation. I want to make this very clear. I can be the problem. But I also want to make it even more clear. Has it occurred to you that you could be the problem? Has it ever occurred to you that Seriously, I may be talking to somebody that's going, huh, really? Yeah. Could you be the problem? Or at least part of it. If your marriage has struggles, the other person actually may be the problem, but so may your attitude. The other person actually technically might be wrong, but you could be more wrong because your attitude is wrong. And if everybody ticks you off, and if everybody else is always wrong, then you are the problem. (laughs) If you just cannot hardly bear life because there's so many stupid people driving down the road, and and everybody else is a nincompoop, then it's possible, just possible, that your attitude is wrong. You know, and I'm being sincere. If you struggle in loving God, and I'm telling you what I felt in that sense of that person loving that dog, the dream that this came from, that was a searing love. That was love that was a one in a thousand kind of a love. It was a real powerful kind of love. And I really, you know, kind of pushing past, you know, some of my, you know, sort of silliness and to be sincere, God is really saying, I want that from you. I I want that, Doug. I want, I want, I want that passionate love. I want you to push past all these barriers. And, And God never puts something on display that he doesn't have a grace that he's willing to release for us to go there. He's not a divine frustrator. He's a divine enabler. He wants us to press in. And I'm just being sincere now. If in loving God or loving people, you are struggling. You're struggling to love people. I'm being sincere now. It's way possible that you love yourself too much. It's way possible you've created an idol out of yourself. If you will never, ever let somebody else win an argument you probably have too high of an opinion of yourself. And I know that sometimes there may be other reasons for problems, okay? But I am suggesting by the Holy Spirit that you consider what I am saying today as a possibility in your life. And I believe that this is a prophetic message because this is not my normal way of communicating. And I'm done. I really am. I'm just going to make this statement. Even if this is just for one person, just close your eyes, please. If this is just for one person, I need to say this to you. I want you to take this with sobriety because I believe this is the error the Holy Spirit told me to pull back and let go, and I'm done. Whatever you're going through right now, you may be the problem. And dying to yourself may be the answer. That's what the Lord sent me to say today. 
I just want you to prayerfully consider that as we go to the Lord in prayer. Whatever you're going through, you may be the problem or at least part of the problem. There's a lot of struggles that go on in reality. You've been lighthearted, but this is life and death. This makes and breaks marriages. This makes and breaks our relationship with our children. Sometimes the ability to witness to a neighbor depends on this, on our willingness to die to ourself. Are you willing to die to yourself? Because if you are, I believe it will propel you into a dimension of loving God and loving people that we've never been to before. And I believe we think we've died to ourselves, but if we take this serious, I think we have a lot further to go than we think. Amen? Amen. Oh, praise God.